Previously on The Spider Ran. Hello YouTube, this is Lost Child 14,000. Just so happens to be the only person to be bitten by this genetically altered super spider. Wakes up with super spider powers. This man got away and killed Peter's uncle because Peter did nothing out of petty, selfish revenge. Trip through a window and Spidey goes on patrol in the big leagues. The goblin, Norman's other half, starts to challenge Spider-Man as part rival, part recruit. Spidey says no, or the goblin pulls him into one last fight, kills himself, or maybe she does know. Struggling for money, become an actress, and Harry has been moving up in the business world of science. The machine goes haywire, kills the doc's wife, and welds four mechanical arms to his spine. And Harry makes a deal. Bring back Spidey alive, and I'll give it to you for free. Hawk trades Spider-Man for Tritium and runs off. Spidey is revealed to be Parker, and in shock, Harry lets him go. Peter arrives at the scene of the second son just in time to negotiate with Hawk and let the bad guy commit suicide with his greatest creation, Peter. But we all know a shitstorm is coming because the ghost of Harry's deranged father shows up to demand vengeance from his drunken, heartbroken, depressed son. Okay. This time around, I'm going to talk about how Spider-Man 3 should have been written. Or, you know, uh, sort of a what if Spider-Man 3 was good. You know. So, listen to me. Looking back, the three Spider-Man movies were not that bad. Not that great, but still not that bad. The first one was the origin, and it brought Spidey to life in true modern style. It wasn't trying to be edgier than it had to be, it wasn't trying to appeal to just the fans of the comic book, and it wasn't making Peter into a big b for the sake of wanting to be a badass. Well, the first two weren't. By the third one, the actors were obviously so tired of working so hard on these films. And really, has anyone actually forgot them already? Here's something that pissed me off. Rebooting something when it's still fresh. Do these movies really need to be rebooted? Well, some movies do. I mean, you know, like Hulk. I'm glad they tried several different angles and tried to make it look like a comic book, but multiple angles all at one time just confused the audience. I know it got some of the younger viewers lost. And the whole atmosphere of the movie was actually, you know, really dark and edgy, even for something that had reveals of the creatures and mutants. The Incredible Hulk was the boot-slash-sequel that we all needed. And then, look at the Superman saga. Not only was it old and dying, and Superman Returns was completely disregarding Superman 4 and 3, I think. Point is, Returns isn't really a reboot. This newest Superman brought Superman back into the public eye, and with a taste for blood. Really? Really? But Spider-Man didn't need a reboot. Not now, anyway. These movies were made possible by nostalgia, and nostalgia alone. And with all the buzz on the internet, I know someone must have been receiving signals from the mothership. You know, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Spider-Man didn't need a reboot. It needed a better path, and or better writing in the middle of Spider-Man 3. This guy, this guy right here, actually had the stones to say that. Well, retard, no. Not only did you change Venom slash Eddie Brock's motives from the comic book, you didn't even show them in the movie. In the comics, Eddie Brock was being taken down left and right by his own greed, Spider-Man, Jameson, cancer, depression. In the film, you don't see what the f*** he's going through, or why he's such a douchebag. You just see Topher Grace, loved him in that 70s show by the way, acting like a greedy little hack and taking it in turn to be a ponce. What the hell? Full rounded character, my ass. And speaking of full rounded characters, let's look at MJ and Peter. Did these two need this much coverage in the film? No. Yes, MJ needed way more coverage and Peter is the main protagonist, but a good portion of this film becomes a soap opera. MJ is struggling to keep her life afloat, and when she needs some real comfort, some real help, this whiny little toad keeps falling for himself. Should've gone for the astronaut, huh? Am I right? And, you know, this part of the story could have been well covered in the beginning, right? It could have gotten worse because of the black suit and not because of other dippy sh**, right? The story could have also focused on the resolution of this relationship, right? I mean, hey, hey, hey. If they had, maybe it could have gone like this. <clears throat> Peter fangirls over himself. He starts to think he can do no wrong and then f**ks things up. 
after some calamity or another, he gets the suit and gets supercharged and malicious. And then, you know, he gets really angry over time and he, you know, starts doing shit to Brock. And then he sees what he's become by going too far with a petty thug or Harry for some reason or an outburst out of character towards one of the people he loves or maybe all of the above. Then he takes the suit off and goes to MJ for help because he didn't punch her in the face. She helps him to not be a d by bringing him back to reality, and reminds him that with his great power he has a responsibility not only to the world, but also to the ones that care for him most. Then he acknowledges the rest of the world and starts to help MJ because it's the right thing to do. He needs some kind of guidance, you know, not a f***ing punching bag. Then they really team up to get back together because, you know, they have three bad guys to deal with. And of course, you know, that whole hairy thing. But no, I guess the whole drama just had to drag through the entire first half of the film, and then some. I mean, you know, these two people, who have known each other since childhood, absolutely had to make their problems worse by ignoring one another, instead of, you know, talking to each other and acting responsibly. You mean, like adults? And he's a superhero, and she's an actress singing in a diner, one long stare is enough to make up for three or four weeks ish of complete and total bullcrap. Wrong! And let's look at the villains. Joan is always good for a laugh or some kind of conflict, and Eddie could have had more to do with both him and Peter. Eddie could have started stalking Peter in order to get a better shot at Spider Man, only to have Peter repeatedly stall him or leave him trapped somewhere. Eddie could have had a photo ruined by Spider Man early on and been accosted by Black Spider Man later on. Peter could also have been less emo and been less of a d to Gwen, making her more attracted to him. Better yet, she could have been the one that he punches in the face. This gives Eddie way more drive to be angry later. Wanting revenge just for a girl, just losing a job, and just being a d about it doesn't amount to murder unless you are really desperate. But we as the audience didn't even get to see how desperate he was in the film, just a lot of acting like a total douchebag. But imagine if Eddie was better characterized, and more focused. What if he wanted Parker dead, because Parker ruined all his chances he ever had with a job? Imagine if Eddie had been hit by Spidey in the black suit through a window or something. Just picture how much Eddie would hate Parker for hitting the woman he loves. Then, imagine he was suddenly given the power to do whatever he wanted by an alien ooze, about halfway through the film. I don't know what you would do, but me, if I had so much reason to kill Parker and I suddenly had the strength to hoist a car over 20 stories, I would be pretty motivated. And I'd probably fight him and make him suffer a lot before one final humiliation. But, you know, I guess in the film, one final humiliation is good enough for, you know, someone who's suddenly been turned into a psychotic powerhouse. Wrong! And how about Sandman? For the most part, I like how they handled him. Not exactly true to the comics, but he was believable. The only things about him I would change is this. Number one, after the big fight with Spider-Man down in the subway tunnels, he knows it's Parker. Maybe he would do a, uh, an internet search or break into public records or something, but in the end, he knows it's Parker. And two, handle the fight like Activision did in the game. Venom takes Sandman's daughter hostage. As for Harry, I really liked how they handled him. He could have had much more focus too, and if Peter had gone back to MJ after thinking that he had killed Harry and punched Gwen, to me, seems like a good way to get them back together, and a good place for MJ to really give it to Peter and start to build them both up. And, you know, put all of this together, and the ending makes more sense too. Sandman would know early on that he needs to apologize to Parker, so that's why he didn't attack them at the very end of the film. Harry comes down to his own realization that Parker is his best friend, minus whatever conflict that they were destined to have, and tries to save his life. And Eddie would want Spider-Man so dead that he would stop at nothing to kill him, no matter how many innocent lives got harmed in the process. Then, when Eddie was separated from the symbiote, he would have that much more reason to save the symbiote because he would feel that he has nothing except that power that he had within the black tarball. This is going to be a bit long, so let's cut it short here. 
Meet me up for part three tomorrow. Don't forget to comment, subscribe, and leave a suggestion. This is Abraham, and I will be here waiting.